As we continue our discussion of Charles Darwin and his book, The Origin of the Species, we want to focus now on his second point, which was natural selection and adaptation. So the first point, descent with modification, we've discussed that and the idea that the species that we see around us, they were basically descended from a common ancestor. And there have been changes over time that have now made many of them look very unlike each other. Natural selection and adaptation basically is the mechanism for that descent with modification. So as we go on and talk about this, there were numerous observations that Charles Darwin made. And the first one was that overproduction would occur if all individuals reproduce successfully. So the idea here is that there are way too many offspring from individuals. I'm sure you've all seen the spider with the egg sac and when that thing ruptures, there's just millions or hundreds of little spiders. And we've seen the seeds on a tree. You've seen the massive amounts of pollen that come from pine trees. So organisms in general produce way too many offspring. And if every one of those offspring were to survive, we would very quickly be overrun. This occurs with humans as well, or it's been proposed to occur with humans. And Thomas Malthus, he did propose and write a book about famine and disease, those types of things, um, really taking a toll on the human population. And the main point that he was making was that when the population becomes too large, we have one of these catastrophes that takes place. Okay, so that was Darwin's first observation, was that if every one of the offspring were to survive, we would have way too many individuals. Now his second point was that environmental resources are limited. So this goes right along with the very first point that we would just have too many individuals if everyone survived. So if we have limited environmental resources, um, there has to be some way to basically balance out this overproduction and the limited environmental resources. His third observation was that the members of a population vary a lot in their inherited traits. Here's just a couple examples of some of that variation. The first picture is a picture of cone flowers. So this is a wild flower, and although at first glance and from a distance, perhaps they all look very similar to a, each other, there are a lot of little unique differences if you look at them up close. And we can begin to get an idea of that if we just look at this picture here. Insects, if you've ever seen massive quantities of insects crawling on a plant. They look the same until you look up close. Ladybugs are the same way. Their spots are all in different locations. So there's a lot of variety around us in these different populations if we just take the time to really look closely. We're all very aware of the fact that within the human population, there's a lot of variety. And one of the keys here to this variety is that not only is it variety, but this is inherited variety. So if it's inherited, this is variety that could then be passed on to offspring as well. The fourth point was that members of a population have an unequal ability to survive and then ultimately to reproduce. So if we have unlimited resources, and we have variations in individuals, some individuals are just going to be better at surviving. And if they survive, then they're going to be more likely to pass on some traits to their offspring. So for example, if you have a really fast animal, well, that animal is going to be more likely to escape predators than say a very slow one. So the fast ones are going to be more li likely to survive and produce their own offspring. The slow ones, a lot of those are going to be eaten or consumed before they ever have the opportunity to produce offspring. So what is this natural selection that Charles Darwin was talking about? Well, remember that we said that organisms produce way too many offspring. And so all of those offspring are not going to survive. Basically, there is differential success in reproduction. So we see these massive amounts of spores coming out of this fungi in this picture here. And each of those spores is different, it's unique. 
some will have a better chance of survival than others will have. We have to keep in mind that natural selection occurs through an interaction between the environment and the variability that's present within the individuals making up a population. So it is definitely an interaction with the environment. Keep in mind that that environment changes from time to time, which means that the important variability is going to change from different from one moment to the next as well. And then also the product of natural selection is the adaptation of a population of organisms to their environment. If we look at these pictures here, we can see the walking stick down at the bottom. It matches very closely to the branch that it's on. This is a product of natural selection. So if you keep in mind the green ones, if they were on the same brown branches, they would be very susceptible to predators. So over time, it's going to be the ones that more closely match the environment that do end up surviving. So all of this brings us to this important concept of Darwinian fitness. So when we talk about Darwinian fitness, this is the contribution that an individual makes to the gene pool of the next generation relative to the contribution of other individuals. So basically, how did they do compared to everybody else? How are their genes going to be present in the population relative to the other one's genes? Some individuals will produce more offspring, so they will have a greater contribution to the genes that are present in the next generation. Now, one of the things that Darwin looked at a lot when he was coming up with this theory of evolution and natural selection and adaptation was artificial selection. This was an example that he talked about in The Origin of the Species. So this is selective breeding. And this has occurred for hundreds of years. There's even cave paintings that show that way back in BC times, people were actually selecting cattle that had traits that were important to them. So we can see that in wall paintings. If we look at the effects of, of artificial selection, think about all of the different dog breeds that we have present. All of those dog breeds had a common ancestor at one point. But when we look at dogs today, there is such variety there. So we have short dogs, we have tall dogs, long hair, short hair, long ears, short ears, you name it. But basically what happened is that if an individual is um, desiring a dog with long hair, then it would look, they would look at a litter of puppies and they would choose the ones that have the longer hair. When they go to breed the dogs for the next generation, they're gonna choose those ones that have the longer hair. So what they're doing is they're selecting that the longer hair genes are going to get passed on to the offspring. And then the next round, they would again select the dogs that have the longest hair. Those would be the ones that they would breed. So they would continuously do that. Man has been doing this, and we can see already just in um, several generations that we have quite an influence on the variety of the dogs that we see around us. And this not only happens with animals, but this happens in plant varieties as well. So if you look at the bottom picture here, we have cabbage, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, cauliflower, um, kale. These are all um, plants that were derived from a common ancestor. Again, lots of variety there. They vary not only in the way that they look, their size, they vary in their ripening times, they vary in their taste, the different nutrients or vitamins that are prevalent in them. So selecting specific traits or characters, then allowing those to reproduce, that does affect what future generations are looking are going to look like. So if you take this same idea and you apply it to natural selection, in natural selection, it would be the environment that's doing the selecting rather than man doing the selecting. But if man is able to artificially change what a population would look like, then we would expect that natural selection could do the same. It may take a longer period of time, but certainly over hundreds of generations, natural selection should be able to produce quite a lot of variety from that original common ancestor. An example of natural selection that we can actually see or visualize is pesticide resistance. If you look at this picture here, um, 
if you spray pesticide on a crop, you probably have a small proportion of the population that is going to be resistant to that, just because we have a lot of variety in the population. So the insects, maybe a few of them are not going to be harmed by the pesticide and they're going to survive. So what you've done is you've selected that only the ones that have this unique um, DNA change in them, they're gonna be able to survive. That means they get to breed and produce the next generation. And so what you're going to see if you repeatedly apply this pesticide is that with each generation, you're going to have a higher percentage that survives until ultimately you have very few individuals that are affected by the pesticide at all. Now, one important thing to keep in mind is that this is not the insects choosing to be resistant. This is basically natural selection acting on what is there. So it's just what happens. It's a random event. Some insects will just be resistant. They are the ones that get to survive and produce the next population or next generation. Another example is viruses. Every year, um, many individuals get a flu shot. Perhaps you do as well. And the reason why we need to have a flu shot every year is because that flu virus is changing constantly. Viruses change rapidly because they have a very fast gener uh, generation rate. So if their generations are very short, then they can produce a whole bunch of changes in a relatively short period of time. And so what used to be an effective vaccine might not be effective the next year when the virus is just slightly different from what it was in the past. 